everyone, welcome to Fish on Fridays. I'm Al McCauley. Today I want to talk about a Marian feast. Uh, that is the visitation. Now the visitation is not held maybe as high up, if you will, as something like the Assumption or the Immaculate Conception, both of which have been promulgated as dogmas, as official teachings. But nonetheless, the visitation is a really important event in, in the scheme of salvation history. But I think it also gives us a whole lot of information about Mary, what kind of person she was, and by extension, what kind of person, what kind of people we're called to be. So let's let's take a look at this. Backing up a bit, you can find the story of the visitation in Luke's gospel, chapter one, starting at verse 39. And by the way, it's the only gospel that has the visitation. The other three don't have it. So it's only in Luke one, starting at chapter 39 or verse 39. And what's happened just as a backdrop is the angel Gabriel has come and announced to Mary that she will give birth to the son of God, to Jesus. And one of the announcements the angel makes is that her relative, Elizabeth, who is in old age, has conceived and will give birth to a son. And we, of course, know that son to be eventually John the Baptist. So given that, after the angel departs, we're told that Mary does something. And I want to read it from my Bible directly because I think it's just a great line and, and I don't want it to be a throwaway line. This is from Luke 1, verse 39. And it says this, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, why is that so important? She went in haste. We're told that she hurried. And there could be a lot of practical reasons for this. She didn't want to waste time on the road because she doesn't want to fall in with robbers. That would make sense. But, you know, I think in a spiritual sense, I think she went in she was in a hurry because she was excited. She was excited, A, that she was going to give birth to the Son of God, but she was also excited for her cousin Elizabeth, who was going to give birth in her old age. Someone who was thought to have been barren and now has this wonderful gift from God, a son that she's going to give birth to. But I think over and above all of that, Mary probably just felt like, I know my mission. I know my calling. This is it. And I, can't, I don't want to wait another day till I start. I want to get on the road and, and live out what God has called me to do. And I think she went in haste because she was excited. She couldn't wait to start living her life in this new way, in this, the new creation that she had become since the angel Gabriel had announced to her that she was going to be the mother of God. At least that's, that's one way to look at it. There's several different artists through history who have depicted this great event of the visitation, of the embrace of Mary and, and, and Elizabeth. And one more line I want to take from Scripture and read to you, because I think it's just so important, is that, you know, Mary, the story unfolds of Mary greets Elizabeth, and as soon as her voice reaches Elizabeth's ear, the baby in Elizabeth's womb starts to stir, starts to dance, to leap. And that's John the Baptist, as if there's a recognition that this is the Son of God and this is Mary, the mother of God. And so Elizabeth very humbly says, wow, how lucky am I that the mother of my Lord comes to me. And Mary responds in this wonderful canticle, this spoken song of praise to God, called the Magnificat. And many of you are familiar with it, but I just want to read again the first line from my Bible from the Magnificat because it just packs a punch in terms of insights into who Mary is and really for us as well. And this is the first line from Mary's response to Elizabeth. This is in Luke chapter 1 and it's verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now, there's two points I want to make about that. The first thing that she does is she magnifies God. And I think that's what makes Mary so great, is that it's never about her. She's not saying, oh, look at me. I'm the mother of God. I must have done something. She recognizes that it's God's grace, God's gift to her, and ultimately to humankind. And she says, my soul magnifies God. I'm blessing God. I'm drawing attention to what God has done, not what I've done. I'm very fortunate. And I think, wow, what a humble, grateful attitude that we could all learn from. The second thing is she says right away after that line, she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And I have so many people who have asked me, people who are Catholic or non-Catholic, say, why do, you, why do you worship Mary? And of course, 
The answer is we don't worship Mary. We pray to her. We pray with her. We ask for her intercession, <clears throat> but we don't pray to her. We don't worship her. She's She needs a savior every bit as much as you and I do. And she recognizes that. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. She's not the savior. She's not the Messiah and she's not God. She recognizes in humility her human humanity. And, and what, again, what a great lesson, a profound lesson that she gives to us. One last thing I'd like you to think about when you think about the visitation, we were told in Luke that um, Mary stays with Elizabeth for what we can surmise is the last three months, basically until Elizabeth gives birth to John the Baptist. And so they're there a long time together. And I, and, and it, I, I hope we have this sense of companionship. You know, the fact that Mary stayed with her and was a companion and walked with, with Elizabeth, they walked with each other, I think is very important and speaks to the communal nature of our faith, that we, we need others. You know, going all the way back to Noah, he to two by two, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, you know, to have somebody to walk with, a companion to be with, to share with, is really so important. And we're called to be in community. And our example of that, the best example of community is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit in perfect relationship with each other. And I think that's what we're called to, to be in community. So I would look at that reading as a challenge to say, who, who do I walk with? Who walks with me? Am I, am I grateful for that companionship? Just as an aside, the word companion comes from two Latin words, com meaning with and pan, bread, means bread, with bread. And so it's got some Eucharistic overtones there, you know, like our companions, when we go to Mass and we partake in the Eucharist, they're our companions because they're with us with bread. It's just fascinating. On a more personal note, think about when you have a gathering of friends or family, where do most people hang out? Probably in the kitchen, where the bread is, where the food is. So anyway... Something to think about. Who are, who are my companions? Who walks with me and in my good times and my bad times? And who do I walk with? Um, it's, it, you know, it's a really important thing to, to consider who our friends are, who our family is, and how do, we, um, how do we treat them and how are we grateful for their presence in our lives. Visitation, wonderful, wonderful celebration to celebrate Mary and to celebrate the church. So uh, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. If it's uh, something you'd like to share, I'd be you know wonderful if you'd do that, share this content. Uh, we'd love it if you'd subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, and uh, keep tuning in every Friday for Fish on Fridays. Until next time, please be good to each other, and God bless. Mm -hmm.